In 2012, a game called Hotline Miami was released, created by Denaton, a two-man team composed of Dennis Vedin and Jonathan Soderstrom, and published by Devolver Digital. What was seemingly just another small indie game took the whole industry by storm, not only earning high scores and accolades across multiple publications, but by inspiring a whole generation of artists, musicians, filmmakers, animators, and game developers. It was stylish, fun, and took an interesting approach to violence in video games that was certainly new for the time, and after the unprecedented success of the game, all eyes were on Denaton for what they could put out next. What started off as a DLC package, one that would be around the same size of the first game meant to flesh out the story and world of the original, grew into a fully fledged release, one with its own identity and things to say. Hotline Miami 2 came out in 2015 to a much more divisive reception. Some critics found it frustrating, pretentious, and lacking in the charm the original contained. For me, it instantly became my favourite game of all time, and I think a lot of the nuances and subtleties were lost on a lot of people. Even six years after its release, I still can't stop thinking about it. In this video, I'll be going over each of the six acts, their purpose, the characters within them, the gameplay, and my reading of the game as a whole. But in order to fully understand this game and what it sets out to achieve, we have to go over a brief recap of what happens in the first game. Set in 1989, Hotline Miami follows a silent protagonist, who fans and later the developers have named Jacket. He receives strange answering machine messages, telling him to perform random jobs at specific addresses. These locations are actually Russian Mafia hotspots, and the objective of each level is to kill everyone inside them while wearing various animal masks. Afterwards, he visits various stores and bars, all operated by the same friendly bearded man, who offers him various things on the house, along with giving some nice conversation. During the first two thirds of the game, Jacket gains a girlfriend and is visited by masked figures in his dreams, asking him questions about his situation, why he's doing the things he is, and what he hopes to achieve. Flyers and articles scattered across his apartment also hint at the bigger picture that's being presented, yet it's never fully explained. His descent into insanity also increases, with hallucinations appearing frequently and his dreams becoming much more hostile. Then, after the bearded man is killed and Jacket's girlfriend is murdered by another masked assailant, it's revealed the whole game until now was a coma recap of the past two months. Our protagonist awakes from the hospital and continues his violent rampages, this time of his own will. The game ends with a showdown between him and the Russian Mafia boss, and after assassinating the head of the family, he throws a photo off the balcony and lights a cigarette. The game is not finished after the credits though. In fact, it rewinds to another protagonist for three last levels, this time playing as a boss from Jacket's story, known as Biker, in hopes of uncovering what exactly is going on. In this epilogue of sorts, a national conspiracy to damage Russo-American relations is uncovered, that there are multiple people receiving these phone calls, all with the same purpose, to kill as many Russians as possible. While this is an in-universe explanation for the events that occur, the game also sets out to explore why people enjoy violent video games, and why people play games in general. If you haven't noticed from the footage yet, Hotline Miami is an incredibly gory and violent game, to the point where it seems like a parody, and on some level it totally is, but it wants to make sure you know how horrible these things are, and make you question why you felt good performing it in the first place. Which brings us to Hotline Miami 2, a game with the goal of not only explaining, furthering, and showing the impact from the events of the first game, but to also explore the nature of video game sequels, how the first game was received, and to take the violence of it to an uncomfortable extreme. And it does so from its very first frame. Immediately, the game confronts the player, asking a question where they draw the line, and for many it was crossed at the opening scene of sexual violence. And I feel it's only fair to give you the same decision the developers give players in skipping this part of the video. There's a timestamp on screen for where to go if you don't want to hear about this, but I do need to discuss it. With context, this is a scene from an in-universe movie based off of the first game, and immediately after the character pulls down his pants, a director yells cut, and the movie set is revealed. When this was presented to journalists in a demo, it gained a lot of headlines claiming it was tasteless, ham-fisted, and misguided. The reception was so bad that it prompted the developers to include a warning and option to skip it. And then afterwards, some publications stated it was chickening out or not sticking to their guns, but I think it actually enhances the product further. This 
scene is an obvious commentary on both how women are portrayed in video games, and also, as I mentioned, asks the player where they draw the line. It also serves as shock value, setting the unnerving tone for the rest of the game. Once that scene is complete, the game begins proper with Act 1, Exposition. This warm-up act is a full introduction to the game's themes, while giving, as the name suggests, some exposition to the world of Hotline Miami 2. It's also a small microcosm of how you can expect the entire game to play out, with some twisted foreshadowing sprinkled in for good measure. Here we're introduced to four of the main characters, Martin, the fans, Pardo and Jake all with varying degrees of likability. It's pretty clear who the fans represent, being the fans of the first game who enjoyed the cool aesthetics and fun gameplay, but the other three are a bit more shrouded in mystery and can have multiple interpretations. I'll save Pardo and Jake for later, but Martin's story is mostly confined to Act 1, so let's talk about him now. The conversation about the connection between fictional and real-world violence is one that has surrounded video games since Death Race showed stick figures getting run over by a car about 30 pixels large. I'm not here to argue for or against this case, and Hotline Miami 1 explored this concept quite a bit. What I can say with almost certainty though, is that there are definitely people out there who played the first game as a release, and to fulfil those violent urges in a way not many other games do as viscerally. This is where Martin comes in. Starring as the lead role in the aforementioned movie from the tutorial, his motivation for performing as this character being to enact those same fantasies but in a fictional environment. To him, the satisfaction is enough of a compromise, but he still has the desires to perform them nonetheless. As you'll find out over the course of this video, most of the characters in this game serve as metaphors for different concepts in real life, and my reading of Martin is that he serves as an allegory for that subsect of players who couldn't care less about the gameplay and instead focused on the intense gore and violence surrounding it, while also chastising players who didn't fully think about what the question, do you like hurting other people, was really trying to ask. This distance between fictional and real-world violence comes crashing together for Martin. As the act ends, he's killed by a gun on set that has its blanks replaced with real bullets. It's never revealed who replaced them, why or how, but the event's shock and confusion prime the player well for what the rest of the game has in store for them. Act 2 is when things fully kick into gear, delivering high-octane action while also furthering the plot and lore. In the opening level of this act, we see our first glimpse of Jacket, on trial for the crimes he committed in 1989. This is through the eyes of Evan, a writer who is working on a book detailing what exactly happened in Hotline Miami 1. If the fans were representative of people who liked the gameplay and style, Evan is representative of fans who got heavily invested in the story and world building of the first game, maybe to the point of obsession, risking his life to interview Russian Mafia members who may know something about Jacket. The rest of the act is dedicated to the fans, and a Russian Mafia member who just can't catch a break. This is probably the most playful the game gets, but even then its sinister undertones seep through by the end of the act. The second level is more character building for the fans, going on a pretty funny mission to save the sister of a friend. And even though it's still horrific if you think about it for more time than the game gives you to, it's played for laughs and gives the fans a very oh you crazy lovable murderers you kind of vibe. The third level shows a Russian henchman on his last mission. It serves to humanise the countless people you slaughtered in the first game, even if you don't really think of it that way, and tells the small story of a man being trodden on by life at the very end. It's quite sad and depressing, but as it's only one level, it makes for a nice break. Then, level 4, titled Execution, happens. Immediately, the amazing music by Perturbator gets the blood pumping, as you see the henchman in a drug fueled anguish over his girlfriend taking the money he stole in the previous level and leaving him. Timing and direction is hard to pull off in cutscenes that require reading and pressing a button to continue dialogue, but every time I play this stage, the music seems to kick in at just the right time, leading to one of the hypest moments in the game, and, well, I'll just show you. What follows is one of the best levels in the entire series, and developer Dennis Vadin's personal favourite. The tight level design combines both the best elements of Hotline Miami 1 and 2's philosophy to stage crafting, to create the perfect base boosted power trip. If you're part of the demographic that the fans represent, this or the following X finale is probably where the game peaks for you. Of course, Hotline Miami 2 is not a game to dwell on this feeling, and in fact punishes it at every opportunity by crashing down into a sense of guilt and dread after every Every high. If the first game was a drug-fueled rave, the second is that same experience followed by the horrible, 
dreadful hangover the morning after. This time it's with a painfully detailed and grim torture slash murder scene of the henchman. And while it feels more brutal from the regular killings that take place across every level, the only real difference is our attachment to the character we're killing. It serves as a reminder that in this world, these are people. They're not just pixels on a screen for those characters. This feeling of uneasiness is one that stays for the rest of the game. Not always up front, but still present until the very end. You know how I mentioned the design philosophy of both games' level structure just then? Well let's talk about the difference between them, and how it was received. The core gameplay of Hotline Miami can be split into two key skills, puzzle solving and twitch reflexes. Each room requires the player to figure out how to clear it, and then perform that solution. It's an ingenious loop that lends itself to infinite replayability with a scoring system and semi-randomised weapons. Even if I know the layout of these levels from the top of my memory, it still feels good to clear them out with a combo meter that can just never seem to get high enough. The first game's level design is a lot more closed, with small rooms densely packed with enemies. You can rely a lot more on your reflexes for most of it, with more enemies that hold melee weapons and tighter walls separating them. This unfortunately led a lot of people to dismiss the idea that it was a puzzle game entirely though, and when 2 rolled around, a lot of the criticism was aimed towards its approach to how levels were structured and how much more difficult it became to mindlessly tackle them. With Hotline Miami 2, levels are a lot more open-ended, with long corridors that enemies can shoot you off screen from, and as the game is longer, of course it will eventually get harder than the original, which means harder puzzles. Puzzles that some people might not even acknowledge exist. It can be frustrating at times, but I think that's intentional. Jonathan Soderstrom is a staunch believer in the games don't have to be fun to be good philosophy of design, and I completely agree. The medium allows itself to so many emotions that can be explored, and more intensely due to the interactivity of it. So when you get killed by an enemy off screen, is it bad design, or is it the game trying to send home a point? This point could be so many things too. It could be to show how much the odds are stacked against some of these characters. It could be to make you question if you really do enjoy this violence when the playing field is equal. I don't think I'm being pretentious here when this is my answer to the saying, If it's not fun, why bother? And I honestly wish more people would open up to the idea that a game being quote unquote fun is not the same as it being playable and well made. Okay, that went into a bit of an offhand rant there. Let's move on to Act 3 before I come across as even more of a pompous art hoe than I already do. <laughs> Act 3 starts off with the main protagonist finally being introduced, Beard from the first game. Except this time it's his real life version instead of the coma interpretation that Jacket had of him. We start to gain some backstory for the universe of Hotline Miami, where a war being fought over Hawaii between the US and Russia took place in 1985. We also see a younger Jacket participating in this war, but after the level ends, we're sent back to 1991 to catch up with the fans and Manny Pardo. Into the Pit starts off like a regular fans level but then devolves back into uneasy territory after a fake out intro room with a much eerier song and some genuinely nasty set dressing. The Pardo segment in this act doesn't offer much in terms of plot development, and I'm still waiting to talk about him later on, but his level does offer some of the most intense and satisfying action in the entire game. The entire act is a build up to its final level in a sense. You can feel things are going to go badly, but for now the rush of violence blinds the player to the obvious direction this game is heading. The act culminates in Death Wish, a final send-off for the fans, where the adrenaline kicks in full force. We get to play as each member fighting their way through hordes of enemies. This truly is the game's climax. I'm not really talking about the soundtrack in this video, because A, it could be a whole video in itself, and B, everyone knows how good this soundtrack is, but I will say Roller Mobster is actually so good, it's just so good, oh my god. Reveling in absolute anarchy before taking all that power away from the player is Denaton's modus operandi though, and what happens at the end of this level kickstarts the other half of the game, and the drastic tonal shift that comes with it. Starting off with the siblings, Alex and Ash, the fans are suddenly killed off in an incredibly anticlimactic way. We then see Pardo enter the picture, confronting the one remaining member of the group and antagonising them before doing this. This gunshot is the point where Hotline Miami 2 turns on the player. In killing the fans, the game removes any pretense of being the fun sequel everyone wanted, and has freed itself from the tonal shadow that, up until now, the first had cast over it. This is when Hotline Miami 2 truly gains its own identity. After this gunshot, everything changes.
After the shock of what just happened, the game takes full advantage of the player's vulnerability with an Evan level, where you can't kill people in a taken over subway station with a song that feels so paranoid and schizophrenic to fit the atmosphere. This is Hotline Miami 2 at its peak. The feeling of complete helplessness and overbearing sense of dread is at its highest at this point in the game. Playing it for the first time, I was dumbstruck at what just happened, but in awe at how it made me feel. I knew from this point on that this was not going to be a happy ending. What I didn't expect was how far the developers would take it. Over the course of the act, the game devolves further into shock, depression and anxiety. Starting off with the secret ending to Evan's level, where Biker from Hotline Miami 1 is shown to now be a washed up drunk who failed his goal and never got past it. Then turning back time to see Beard's War falling apart right in front of him, being sent on suicide mission after suicide mission. And then there's Jake. Not content with killing off another protagonist in a cutscene, Hotline Miami 2 sweeps the rug from under underneath the player's feet once again, by having a player death be the downfall of this main character. It's an ingenious trick that serves the twisted purpose of this act, being to make the player feel completely powerless to the whims of the developers. And it works. This objective comes to its natural peak in the final level of the act, with one emotional gut punch after another. We see the backstory for Jacket's emotional connection to Beard after a frustrating, tiring level that can feel like you're fighting against impossible odds on a first playthrough. But at the end, it's like a victory. This elusive character we've only seen in warm, dreamlike depictions in the first game, being shown to be the sole survivor and friend of Jacket. We've learned a lot about this silent protagonist, and we've gained a proper connection to the events of Hotline Miami 1. Then the bomb is dropped. After what seems to be a small light at the end of this dark tunnel of an act is teased, the missing piece of this puzzle that shouldn't have happened is shown, and the harrowing truth of this world, these characters, and this game is revealed. This game is a post-nuclear war story, and if after this you can't see the writing on the wall for how it will end, you're blind. We're about two thirds of the way through the game now, but by this point most of the main characters' stories have been concluded, so I feel this is a good opportunity to talk about them, what they mean, and their significance to the major themes and message of the game. Each character serves both a narrative and a meta-narrative purpose. Hotline Miami 2 has its own story to tell, for sure, but that's not all it sets out to do. If Hotline Miami 1 was a game about games and violence in them, then 2 is about game sequels, the reception to the first game, and also furthers the commentary laid out by 1. I've talked about the fans, Martin and Evan, and how they all represent specific types of people who played the first game, but there's one more protagonist that I haven't talked about, which I feel comments on another type of player. Jake is shown to be a hyper-nationalist patriot, and uses that nationalism as an excuse to commit violent acts. Even before his connection to 50 Blessings, he's shown in the prequel comics to gruesomely beat and slaughter innocent bystanders if he even suspects they're Russian. I feel this is a parallel to people who will take the message from this and the first game to be that Russians are evil and need to be eradicated, a misguided sentiment that certainly exists, and not only within the fanbase of this specific series. A prime example of prejudice leading people to gain the exact opposite message of a piece of art is the Metal Gear Solid series, where there are multiple fans who will take pride in being xenophobic and incredibly militaristic, despite the direct message of war being a game with no winners. Manny Pardo is a different case though. While his story is finished in Act 6, I'll lay it all out here for the sake of pacing. Manny's plotline within the context Text of the game is that he's a detective working on a serial murderer case, the perpetrator being dubbed the Miami Mutilator. After sprees of vigilante justice in his levels, he investigates crime scenes of the Mutilator, playing the part of a hardened cop, complete with cheesy cliché lines that are honestly played for laughs more than anything else. His entire demeanour is like the funniest the game gets, as he's completely charmless to everyone but himself, becoming a fan favourite among the game's community. <laughs> like seriously, the month of Pardo posting online after the game's launch was just amazing. <laughs> it's then revealed in the final act that Manny is the murderer, planting crime scenes and fake evidence that he can solve himself in order to gain fame and notoriety. His story ends with him realising he may have left evidence that reveals this, and his final level is played entirely in his own mind as he imagines killing the entire police station in a last ditch effort to save himself. He also spends a lot of his time in the story trying to hype up the case of the mutilator, and is often jealous of everyone focusing on Jacket still during his trial. This is where I feel the meta aspect of Pardo's character comes into play. After the insane success of Hotline Miami 1, there are a slew of games inspired by it, some taking the formula and doing new things with it, and others that are just like, <laughs> how is this not a lawsuit? <laughs> 
but even the best games that came out from this still felt somewhat derivative. And it might be cynical to say this, but I think Manny Pardo is a commentary on that. He feels like it's his time in the limelight, but just due to the nature of what he's doing, will always live in the shadow of the original. In the same way, you really can't talk about Katana Zero without mentioning Hotline Miami. His bitterness towards this is apparent as well. Before killing Tony from the fans, he mentions how they had their 15 minutes of fame. Beard's story is one of the saddest in the game, and I feel it's also one of the most personal ones. While not directly responsible, he plays a huge part in the events that lead to the rest of the series. Despite wanting a quiet life once the war is over, he's only met with more turbulence, and ended up spawning something bigger than he could have ever imagined. To me, this seems like a parallel to the development process and launch of Hotline Miami 1. Looking at interviews between Jonathan and Dennis, they've talked in length about how exhausting and hellish the final few months of making the game were, how they were living off of no money, and mentioning things like Dennis being admitted to a psych ward for two weeks at one point. It honestly sounds like hell. Then once the game was released, they were suddenly rock stars in the industry overnight, gaining money and notoriety unlike anything they could have conceived. None of that made them happy though. In fact, they've said it's probably negatively impacted their life. Moving from working on a small-time passion project with your friend, to having banks sending you letters daily about your money, and seeing what was supposed to be a small game for a small group of people be lauded as game of the year must be stressful, especially for someone who suffers from anxiety. I can't feel sorry for myself. I feel like I'm an asshole for not taking responsibility for my life. But I don't know what to do about it. Both Beard and Denaton didn't know what they were doing, but it ended up causing a major impact that they might honestly not have wanted. Of course, this isn't the only aspect of the game that reflects the developer's incredibly personal feelings. Which leads me on to Act 5. <sighs> okay, this is gonna be uncomfortable, but I wouldn't mention it if I didn't feel it was necessary to understand this portion of the game. Please consider and respect the developer's privacy while I attempt to handle this as respectfully as possible. During the development of Hotline Miami 2, Jonathan Soderstrom's mother passed away. I'm lucky enough to not have experienced that level of grief, so I can't imagine how it must have felt. What I can say though is, I feel he used those emotions during that time to create something beautiful within the game. Act 5 focuses on one singular protagonist. Richter. As he tells Evan in a phone interview his viewpoint of the events from the first game, we're shown a truly human perspective on a participant of the murders that surround Hotline Miami 1. Richter is being forced by 50 Blessings to commit the same atrocities that Jacket did, and while he must have signed up for the same newsletter as the rest of the members, he seems reluctant to participate until being threatened with his car torched. Unlike the other masked killers, Richter's primary motivation is not one of nationalism, but to protect his sickly mother. Before and after every mission, we see his home life, where he looks after his mum in any way he can, while also trying to shield her from the horrid truth of his situation. What was just a minor antagonist from the first game becomes the main protagonist in one of the most heartfelt and genuine side stories I've ever seen in a game. It recontextualizes the player's perception of what an average 50 Blessings member looks like, and what their personal lives entail instead of the badass figures of Jacket and Biker or the hypernationalist scumbag of Jake, while also including some parallels to one, increasing the impact of his story greatly. The first three levels of the act are all incredibly short, because it knows when to let gameplay take a backseat in favour of story. And while not much is progressed in the general plot, I feel this act is both an intimate look into the love Jonathan has for his late mother, and an incredibly needed palate cleanser before the final act of the game. Intermission ends with an incredible bang as usual, but unlike the slow build-up to the finales of previous acts, this one earns its explosive payoff by forging the connection between Richter and his mother. After he's arrested and imprisoned as seen in Hotline Miami 1, he's given the opportunity to reunite by escaping from jail during a riot. The fact this happens also gives more characterization to Jacket, as it shows he did not kill Richter when given the opportunity. Despite being the one to murder his girlfriend, Jacket must have felt some empathy after hearing they were both getting the same phone calls. The act ends with Richter finishing his story to Evan, asking for a ticket to Hawaii so his mother can join him in safety as payment. We're also given the only narrative choice in the game here. Evan's obsession with the masked killers has led his family life to ruin, and the player gets to decide whether to continue writing his book or salvage the relationship with his wife and children. It's actually interesting that Evan and Richter are the only two characters who could be deemed to have a happy ending. Both are constantly trying to escape the violence they wind themselves up in, and both are able to move past it onto a better life with what they have left. Richter earning his by caring for his mother above all else, and Evan who earns his by taking Richard's advice and choosing what's most important 
on to him. Oh wait, I haven't talked about Richard yet, have I? Shit, we've only got one more act left, so let's do that before we get into this insane ending. Richard is the being that ties every character together across the series. He's there to enforce the themes of the games, and confront both the player and the characters on their actions, motivations, and end goals throughout. Along with being the only supernatural element in the series, he's also the biggest channel for the developers speaking directly to the player, more so than their actual cameos within the games. In Hotline Miami 1, he visited Jacket in his coma to help him piece together the events leading up to it, along with asking him, and in turn the player, questions about whether they enjoy violence, where they expect the game's story to go, and if they actually care about that at all. The last time he's seen in the game is before Jacket wakes up, where Richard tells him nothing that happens past this point will matter in the grand scheme of things, and that the course of history is already set in motion. But by this point, Jacket doesn't really care. In Hotline Miami 2, Richard is an angel of death of sorts, visiting every character before their demise. One of the most poignant questions Richard asks the player in the first game is, do you like hurting other people? By the second game we already know that answer, since they're coming back for more. Instead he asks, to what extent? A recurring theme throughout most characters is their willing blindness to the bigger picture, focusing on trivial matters that inevitably lead to self-destruction along with the destruction of others. That's also why he appears to Evan a long time before his death. Being one of the only redeemable characters in the series, Richard gives him a chance to spend his remaining time left with the people who matter most to him. This theme of choosing blindness in order to gain frivolous personal goals is hit home one last time in the final act of the game. Following the son of the Mafia boss killed at the end of Hotline Miami 1, in his plight to regain power after the damage dealt to the organisation. All for a vain sense of duty and honour to his late father and grandfather. One that's shot down by Richard, but by that point the son is too far gone to see. This act can feel rather aimless, but it serves a significant purpose in the grand scheme of the game. The son's levels are some of the most intense, both in difficulty and atmosphere. They're the closest the game gets to the drug fueled 80s feeling of the first, and its placement within Hotline Miami 2 is all intentional. Seeing this character quickly transform from being a small time mob boss to overtaking the now more prevalent Colombian Mafia, escalating in an uncomfortably quick manner is the game spiralling out of control. Everything's been wrapped up, but A, fans will always want more, and B, we need a big finale, and boy does it deliver on that second goal. After dominating the main headquarters of the Colombians, we see the sun basking in his glory, getting ready for a party, and taking a huge amount of drugs. And what follows is an experience which feels like the entire series was leading up to. And if you've played this game, you'll know what I mean when I say everything that follows. An explosive LSD dream slash nightmare of colours and symbolism barrages the player. It's a quick, intense, and gory moment of pure ecstasy. And before you know it, it's over. As the sun walks off into what he assumes is Asgard, the credits start to roll. This is the send-off everyone wanted and expected, and if the game truly ended here, it would be a weird story to cap off on, but a welcome spectacle that ended on a brilliant high note. But this is Hotline Miami 2. We all know this isn't how the story ends. After a brief credits fake out, the game jumps forward to Richter and his mother in Hawaii, relaxing after the ordeal both he and the player went through. Out of seemingly nowhere, a news report comes on TV announcing the assassination of both the US and Russian presidents, and how it will mean nuclear war for both countries. Richard then appears to explain how this was all inevitable. This was the bigger picture he was talking about, and how nothing can be done to stop it. Richter accepts this wholeheartedly, and the beauty of Hotline Miami 2's ending fully takes place. The drug trip wasn't what these games were leading up to. This is. As we see every character left alive get blown away by nuclear fire, You Are the Blood by the Castanets plays. Escalating violence will only lead to one thing, total annihilation. This is what this ending, and all of Hotline Miami 2 is about. Whether it's real, fictional, for personal or political reasons, there's only one thing that it can lead to, and that's more violence. The ending of Hotline Miami 2 is truly beautiful, both calming and distressing, filled with euphoria and depression. It serves a wonderful but heartbreaking message told in the most brutal and shocking way, which is exactly what this entire game sets out to do. Beating the game on hard difficulty leads to the lyrics of a Civil War song being shown at the end of the credits. The song is from the perspective of a drummer boy who was fatally wounded during the Battle of Gettysburg, singing to his mother during his final moments. While originally a patriotic song honouring 
honouring those in battle, under this context it mirrors so much of the anti-nationalist message the game contains. It doesn't matter what flag or cause this boy is fighting under, what matters in that moment is that he's dying. He'll never get to see his mother again, but all he can think of is the idea of a country he's fighting for. A country that did not care about him and put him on the front lines of battle. After witnessing the ending to this game, it makes you feel sick. Its inclusion can also be seen as how Jacket feels about his imprisonment and death, with his misguided patriotism taking over any other emotion he once had. All of this leaves Hotline Mammy 2 on a note so crushing, yet so emotionally fulfilling, that it amazes me every time I experience it. But it only works due to the absolutely genius pacing of the entire game, something that most critics at the time failed to see. So before I wrap this up, here's why Hotline Mammy 2 has some of the best story pacing of any game ever. Now, from a chronological point of view, the story of this game is a bit all over the place. If you drew a line showing how often it jumps between characters and years, it would look a lot like this. Okay, so we start in 91 with the fans, and then we go back to 89, and then we see Evan, and then we see him in like 85, and then we catch up with Pardo, and then I think Richter's around here somewhere, and then I think he's just like, Aah! And a lot of criticism was aimed at how disjointed it all felt, detractors claiming it was just a Pulp Fiction knockoff that was convoluted for the sake of it. But I believe there was a much greater intention behind this story framing. Hotline Miami 2 puts a greater focus on the emotional throughline rather than chronological order of events. This allows the developers to take the player on a literal roller coaster of feelings that is crafted to perfection. It's also the reason I had to go through every act individually, because they each have their own purpose in the grand scheme of the game. Self-contained, they all follow the same level of escalation to a breaking point before crashing down into uneasiness and depression. Combined, they follow that same structure, just on a much greater scale and repeated multiple times. Act 1 to 2 is the build up, Act 3 is the adrenaline fueled payoff, Act 4 is the dip, Act 5 starts to pick up again while still maintaining the melancholy that 4 ended on, just at the end starting to build up that hype and adrenaline again, where in Act 6 it sets the player up to feel like a god by the end, and only then does it perform the final blow. What the developers sacrificed in ease of understanding for a first time player paid off in spades with atmosphere and tonal consistency. Not only that, but the the structure allows for so many details to be noticed on subsequent playthroughs. Things like the son's drug trip actually being him killing the fans one by one, the foreshadowing by Richard telling the player and Martin that this story has a twist that they don't think anyone will like, and just the entirety of Pardo's story, like the secret victim in the trunk of one of his levels, or his fears of a sting operation in his final level being the police calling him about the nuclear strike. These are only a few things that can be truly appreciated on your second or third time round, but every play playthrough will still have that same emotional punch, one that's emphasised within the key box art for the game. The key art of Hotline Miami 2 reflects every single emotion one has while playing the game. The background is filled with rage, utter chaos and violence as the main characters are engulfed in flame. Note how none of them are facing the viewer, all of them looking at something else instead of the bigger picture. At the heart of the game is Beard, and that feeling of emptiness surrounded by carnage. By the end of this game, you'll feel drained, burned out, and hopeless. Constantly escalating violence will only lead to the complete destruction of everything, and the one person who can see that is staring right back at you. It's completely beautiful, yet ugly and visceral at the same time. And much like the game itself, only after witnessing the end can you truly understand what it sets out to do. Hotline Miami 2 is a game that, like its cast, doesn't pull any punches, and is completely confident in its themes, story, and gameplay, not caring how anyone else might view it. My love for this game is indescribable. It's the defining piece of media from my adolescence, and has formed me unlike anything else in both my creative works and worldview as a whole. It opened my eyes to seeing games as a true art form, and its influence can be seen in countless other works, ranging from small indie games to multi-million dollar AAA titles. No amount of words I say can do it justice though. Like any truly great game, it needs to be played to be fully understood, and with every playthrough, my appreciation for it only gets greater, even six years after release. It's not like the original that was instantly gratifying and accessible, but it doesn't try to be, which is partially why I think it wasn't received as well at launch. It's a much slower burn that deserves every second you spend on it. The more time it's given, the better it gets. Even after completing it for probably like the 14th time, it still makes me uncomfortable, it still makes me laugh, it still makes me feel joy, rage, and guilt, 
and it still makes me cry. I don't think I'll ever feel this way about any other game, but that's something I'm more than fine with. It's a layered game that covers so many topics with such unapologetic boldness. It's about the inherently destructive nature of nationalism. It's about violence, both real life and fictional, showing how they can affect each other. And it's a commentary on both games and sequels as a whole, while also staying as an incredibly personal labour of love filled with so much care and passion that it seeps out from every corner of the experience. And that's why Hotline Miami 2 is a misunderstood masterpiece.